Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's remind ourselves how it is that we solve by factoring, right? So in order to solve by factoring, we first have to arrange the equation in a particular way. So what do I need to do first in number one before I can solve by factoring, Megan? Um, you have to subtract 56 over and set equal to zero. Good, thank you. And so once we subtract over the 56 and set equal to zero, then we can consider, consider the factors. So first thing we'll do is subtract over the 56, rewrite the standard form and set it equal to zero. Next, we'll go ahead and consider, right, consider if there's a greatest common factor hiding inside. So we stop, think, GCF, is there a greatest common factor hiding inside? No, the 1x squared, the negative 1x, and the negative 56 don't share any uh, common factors, and so we're ready to make our parentheses pair. So we'll go ahead and consider the factors of the last that multiply, right, the multiply to give me negative 56, but sum to give, I'm sorry, negative 56, but sum to give me that middle term of negative 1. And so as I consider the factors of the last here, I'm thinking uh, plus and minus 1 and 56, oh geez, we have a whole bunch, don't we have 2 and 28, uh, 4 and 14, oh my gosh. 5, 6, 7, 7, and 8. And now I think we got them all. Did, did I get them all? Great. Okay, so go ahead and tell me the winning combination for my factorization. The winning combination based on those integer factor pairs, only one of them, such that when placed as my last, are going to multiply to give me negative 56, but sum to give me negative 1. And then go ahead and share with the class when I call on you. So what's the winning combination here? Um, Taylor and Jared? 7 and 8. Raise your hand if you guys had 7 and 8. 7 and 8. Good. And what signs are those going to have to be in? Opposite signs. Good job. So we're narrowing it down here. We still have we still have it. So what are we going to have to do to fill this in, Carson? Negative 8 and positive 7. Awesome. Great. Thank you. After we have it fully factored, we'll go ahead and set each individual factor equal to 0 and solve separately using the 0 product property. So we've got x minus 8 equals 0, we've got x plus 7 equals 0, and I'm getting two solutions. I'm getting x equals 8, and I'm getting x equals negative 7. Raise your hand if you have the same solutions. We have the same solutions. You guys are awesome. Way to go, you guys. So now we'll go ahead and check out number 2. It looks like number 2 is already arranged in standard form. Everything on one side set equal to 0. So we don't have to perform any first step the way we did that Megan told us before, we're already set equal to zero. So we'll go ahead and stop, think, GCF. Is there a greatest common factor hiding inside that'll chunk those numbers down to smaller values and make it easier for subsequent factoring? So what did you get for that, Kendall? Uh, I said, you know, factor. And what was it? Uh, 2 and x. Absolutely, thank you. So Kendall factored out a 2x and that chunked down my remaining trinomial to smaller numbers. So after factoring out a 2x, we were left with x squared minus 11x plus 10. And now we'll go ahead and do the same, the same factoring party. So we'll go ahead and keep the 2x out front, but we'll break up that blue, that blue trinomial into a product of two binomials, right? Undoing FOIL. So again, we can fill in our variables x and x. We'll find the factor pairs of 10, then multiply to give me a positive 10, but sum to give me a negative 11. And while I have multiple choices for 10, I've got plus and minus 1 and 10, or 2 and 5. Only one of those pairs is going to sum to give me that negative 11. So which pairing are we going to have to use there? Uh, Megan and Andrew? 1 and 10. 1 and 10, I agree. And so we'll have to do the 1 and 10. And this time, it looks like same signs, right, because my last product was positive. If they're same signs and my middle sum is to a negative, they must both be negative. So I got 2x times quantity x minus 1 times x minus 10 is my fully factored form. Now we can go ahead and utilize the zero product property, but that first factor this time is going to de determine an additional solution. Check it out. This 2x, right, contributes to a solution the same way that my parentheses factors contribute to a solution. This 2x set equal to 0 will give me one solution x value. We'll set x minus 1 equal to 0, and we'll set x minus 10 equal to 0. So it looks like we're going to get three solutions. I get x equals, uh-oh. 
I get x equals 0. I get x equals positive 1. And I get x equals positive 10. Raise your hand if you have the same three solutions. You get all three solutions. How do you know that there's no more solutions hiding out there? We had two in the first <laughs> one. We had three in this one. What lets me know that there's no more solutions hiding out there? Right. Does anybody remember? How can we tell that there's no more solutions hiding out there? Megan? Is it because the largest exponent is 3? Absolutely. Because this was a cubic polynomial, degree 3, that's telling me at maximum I have three distinct solutions. And it looks like we found three, so I know there's no more hiding. Excellent. Good job. All right, one to go. Add or subtract. Get everything on one side set equal to zero. So it looks like we have to rearrange this bad boy, and I get 6 and cubed. I'm sandwiching in the n squared term by subtracting it over so I can put in standard form. Plus 7 and now we're in standard form is it equal to zero. Stop. Think. GCF. And as I scan the problem, looks like that 6 and 7 don't share anything, and 23 is prime. So I don't get, oh, I get an n. We get an n, so variables count. We can chunk it down to small variable exponents, at least if I factor out an n. That leaves me with 6 n squared minus 23 n plus 7. And if we're already told to solve this by factoring, I know that I'm going to be able to break that up into a parentheses pair. So, so I'm going to keep this party going. It looks like we want the n. But now I've got to consider, oh gosh, not only the factors of the last, but also the factors of the first. 6n squared, right? 6n squared could come from 6n and n, or it could come from 3n and 2n. So we've got multiple choices here. 6 and 1, or 2 and 3. Um, and then 7, the good news is that 7 can only come from one integer pair of factors, 1 and 7. Okay, so it looks like we can use that to our advantage. Because my red 1 and 7 only has a single choice, it might be helpful to fill that in first. Right, it has to be 1 and 7. Also, I know that they're same signs because my plus 7 last, my last term is positive, so they must be same signs given that they're same signs. If my middle term is negative, I also know they must be both minus. So it looks like even though I don't know if my firsts are 6n and n or 3n and 2n, I already can fill in lots of stuff. Excuse me. Uh, a little bit. Awesome. All right, so let's go ahead and see if we can't find the winning combination. Is it going to have to be... Is it going to have to be the 2n or the 3n? So we need to now find the first placement that's going to create an outer product and an inner product that sums to give me the negative 23. And so because this is a 7 here, it looks to me like if I get the 3 times the 7, I'd get to 21. Plus another 2 times 1 is 2 is giving me to 23. Hooray! So it looks like math's going to work yet again. Whew, it was close there for a minute. I wasn't so sure. So it looks to me like we need the 3 and here. We need the 2 and here. And then we'll be able to set each individual factor equal to zero and solve. So it looks like we'll get n, 3n, 2n minus 7. I'm going to go ahead and move that out of the way. And it looks like we'll get three different, three different equations this time. We've got n equals 0, 3n minus 1 equals 0, and lastly, 2n minus 7 equals 0. So we get n equals, add the 1 over, divide by 3, positive, 1 third. So add the 7 over, divide by 2, positive, 7 halves. And I'm dying to know if anybody got all the way here. So raise your hand if you got n equals 1 third, n equals 7 halves. A couple of you did, n equals 0. Good job, you guys. That was the trickiest factoring one, right? Because it had a first, a first product that wasn't just 1n squared or 1x squared. It was 6n squared. And that added to the, to the combinations for my placements of the first and the last. Awesome. What questions do you guys have about 1, 2, and 3? Then next, we're going to go ahead and... Next, we're going to go ahead and 
list the four different methods we have. And so we've got lots of methods here, right? We've got lots of methods. Go ahead and share with the class one method when I call on you. So what's one method that we used for solving quadratic equations, right? What was one method that we used? Andrew? Uh, the taking of the square root. Good. And so we solved by taking square roots before, right? We solved by taking square roots. We know square roots undo, undo squaring. So taking square roots. Thank you. What's another method that we use to solve quadratic equations? Right? What's another method that we use to solve quadratic equations? Mark? Um, factoring. Well, we use factoring. In fact, we use it in our color to solve. So factoring is another method. Thank you. Aside from solving by taking square roots right, immediately and factoring, right, what was our, our, our second favorite game right, when we played complete them? What was that method called? Nathan? Yeah, completing the square is good. Thank you. Completing the square. And lastly, the last thing we learned, right? What's that called? So what was the last thing we learned? What was that called? Samantha? Absolutely, the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula. The last recipe we learned. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Now let's go ahead and say when is each most appropriate. And so when is each of these methods most appropriate? And so we've seen that time and time again. We know it was appropriate to solve by taking square roots if there was a single squaring term. So a single squaring term, then it was appropriate to solve by taking square roots. When is it appropriate to solve by factoring? Well, we've got both x squared and x terms, so both quadratic and linear term, but I recognize the factors. I can factor it when I'm in standard form. So factoring is appropriate to try when they're both, both linear and quadratic terms, but I can factor. Completing the square was appropriate if there's both x squared and x terms, right? But I didn't recognize the factors. And if my leading coefficient is 1 and my middle term is even, then it was relatively easy to complete the square. So I'm going to go ahead and say 1 x squared and even x term. Then completing the square was a viable option. And lastly, the quadratic formula. An ax squared term where the leading coefficient isn't one, right? An odd x term or big numbers. All of which would be appropriate, right, to use the quadratic formula. So I'll go ahead and say if we have an ax squared term and or odd x term, and or big numbers, and or can't factor. All of those are potential reasons for why I would choose to use the quadratic formula. Right? Awesome. What questions do you guys have about our methods then? Great. Let's go ahead and take care of our homework then. At this time, I'd ask that you go ahead and take out your assignment number eight. I'm going to pause the recording. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take a look at our objectives for the day. So again, we're going to solve quadratic and polynomial equations, right? And we're going to use those four methods, those four methods that we looked at earlier. We're going to choose the most appropriate method and be able to explain why, and that's part of your assignment tonight solving equations efficiently, worksheet number three.
All right, so three. First, state the best method to use to solve each, then explain why. Lastly, we're going to solve and check. And so as I scan this one, what looks like the most efficient method to solve this one and why? So what looks to be the most efficient method to solve this one and why? Go ahead and tell your partner now, and then I'm going to call you to share with the whole class. Yeah. Best method, Chrissy and Hans? Square, square roots, how come? Because there's only one x value. Raise your hand if you agree. Solving by square roots. Yep, there's a single squaring term. Thank you, guys. So we would solve by taking square roots. <laughs> how come? Because there's a single squaring term. Single squaring term. Let's do it. So here we go. It looks like best first step. Add seven to both sides. Next. Undo that multiplication to isolate my squaring term. So divide both sides by three. Next best step. That gets our squaring term x squared alone. So finally we can get after it. We can undo squaring now with square rooting. And so if x squared is given by 16, then x must be given by the positive and negative square root of 16. Sometimes it will reduce, sometimes it won't. But either way, I'll be able to get my two solutions. So it looks like x equals positive square root of 16. That would be positive 4. And negative square root of 16 would be negative 4. Awesome. So we've got solving by taking square roots. It's appropriate for use when I've got a single squaring term. Awesome. All right, which method should we try here? Right, which method should we try here? Well, it looks like we've got an x squared and an x in the same problem. So before I can tell, it helps, it's helpful to rearrange. So I'm going to go ahead and subtract that over and rewrite in standard form so that I can decide the most appropriate method. It looks like we've got some options here. And so after I get in standard form and consider the factors of the last 13, I know that 13 is prime. So only 1 and 13 is the integer pair that multiplies to give me 13. However, 1 and 13 won't sum to give me the middle term negative 6, which means that factoring is right out the window. Since there's x squared and x is, we know we can solve by taking square roots directly, which leaves us with complete the square or quadratic formula. Because this is a 1x squared, and an even middle term, that negative 6 is even. I'm going to go ahead and do completing the square just to remind us about that method, okay? Though we could certainly use quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and do complete the square to practice. We haven't done that for a while. So complete the square. And that's appropriate because we've got a 1x squared term and an even, an even linear term, or even x term, right? That's 6x. So that means it's not going to be bad. In order to complete the square, we add or subtract to get the x's on one side and everything else on the other. So my best first step now is to subtract the 13 over so that I get all my x's on one side and everything else on the other. I'm going to rewrite, but leave room. Scooch the equal sign over because we want to make space to play our complete the game. After scooching over the equal sign, I'll go ahead and consider that special number, the special number that I'm going to add to both sides to complete the square. And so we know to get that special number, I'll have to consider my middle term. The reason I thought complete the square was a good method was because my middle term was even. How come? Well, I have to get half of, half of that middle term to determine what would go in my, my binomial such that when I square it, I'll produce this, this perfect square trinomial that I'm about to make. So what's half of minus 6? Well, minus 3. So x minus 3 is going to be the binomial such that when squared produces my red perfect square trinomial. However, I don't have the perfect square trinomial yet until I add that special number. So what will I have to add there? half of that middle term, then square it. We have to square that 3. So that would be a plus 9, plus 9, 
the special number I'm adding to both sides is plus 9. That allows me to rewrite the left-hand side as x minus 3 quantity squared. We've already done it because I made those parentheses when I did half of it. But on the right, meanwhile, back at the hacienda, we still need to combine like terms. And so it looks like negative 13 plus 9 equals negative 4, right? Negative 4. Now I've rewritten as a single squaring term. Now it is appropriate to solve by taking square roots because I have a single variable term, quantity squared. When I do that, right, we get something a little bit different. When I undo the squaring to get my x minus 3 quantity alone, I get plus or minus square root of negative 4. Before this unit, we would stop right here and say no real solutions, right? We can't have a negative inside of, inside of an even root, like a square root. But now we have the tools to handle this. And so we're not going to stop now. We're going to keep going and get the two solutions. The two solutions is just they'll have i in them. And so it's no problem now. We can still, we can still solve this problem. I'm going to go ahead and break up into two separate parts and get x minus 3 equals root negative 4. And I'm going to get x minus 3 equals negative root negative 4. I'm going to focus in on that square root of negative 4. Recall that a negative inside of a square root is equivalent to an i out front. Then I can handle the number part inside the radical the same as we always have. Namely, the square root of 4 is equivalent to 2. And so I know that... I know that the square root of negative 4 is just going to be 2i. And so it looks like I get two separate answers. x minus 3 equals 2i. And x minus 3 equals negative 2i. Go, go, gadget And I get x equals 3 plus 2i and x equals 3 minus 2i. So I get two separate answers here. Rachel? It's a really random question. Is the x squared term called a quadratic term? Yes. Yep. The quadratic, a quadratic term is just a fancy name for a squaring term. Just like a linear term is a fancy, na fancy name for an x term, or an x to the first. Good job. Awesome. What questions do you have about the second? All right, let's go ahead and rearrange the standard form so we can pick the best method. I'm going to go ahead and subtract over. I'm going to subtract over. And now, I could try factoring, right? I could try factoring, but I'm concerned about my factors of the first 2x and 1x. Multiplying the factors of the last, that's 6, and being able to get to 3 might cause some problems. And so I think this is a great opportunity to practice our other method, quadratic formula, where I have a ax squared term that's not 1x squared. See how that's 2x squared? and an odd linear term. And so I think quadratic formula is a great time to practice now. So I'm going to choose the quadratic formula for this one, again, to practice. So the quadratic formula. And why am I going to use the quadratic formula? Because I've got a 2x squared instead of a 1x squared, and an odd, an odd linear term. So it would be hard to complete the square. Also, I don't recognize the factors. All right, so the quadratic formula, right, is a great way because it'll always work regardless if I have a leading coefficient other than one or an odd linear term. All I need to do is pick out the values of A, B, and C when I'm in standard form. Go ahead and tell the class the value of A when I call on you. Get ready. What I'm going to use for A here. Casey? Uh, two. Two. Thank you. What will I use for B? Kenzie? Negative three. Thank you. What will I use for C? What will I use for C? Jacob? Uh, awesome. 
Now let's go ahead and plug those into my quadratic formula. I know x is given by the opposite of b over twice the value of a plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, close radical, all over twice the value of a. Except everywhere I see an a, I'm going to put 2. Everywhere I see a b, I'm going to put negative 3. And everywhere we see a C, we're going to put negative 6. All right, guys, let's evaluate. So we're going to jump inside there and evaluate. X equals opposite of negative 3 is positive 3 over 2 times 2 is 4. So 3 fourths. Plus or minus, let's jump inside the radical. Keep in mind that B squared is always going to be positive. That's why I use parentheses. I use parentheses so that if I were entering this in my calculator, right, it wouldn't do squaring first and then times the negative. It would do negative 3 times itself, which is what b squared means to do. So inside my radical, I'm getting 9 plus 48. Are you guys getting that? 4 times 2 is 8 times 6 is 48, right? Close radical over 2 times 2 is 4. Equals So I'm getting 3 fourths plus or minus, and it looks like my radical here, 48 plus 9 gives me 57, and 57 is prime, isn't it? Right. So it doesn't, doesn't contain any first square factors all over 4. So it looks like those are my final answers. These are two solutions. One is 3 plus, I'm sorry, 3 fourths plus root 57 fourths, and one is 3 fourths minus root 57 fourths. I'm going to go ahead and back this up so it's not so extended. There we go. Awesome. So still two answers. Awesome. What questions do you have about this one? Then we're closer. Let's go ahead and Take a look at one with a higher degree. And so if we have a higher degree polynomial at this stage, right, we're going to always look for a GCF and see if we can't chunk it down to a quadratic equation. So stop, think GCF, and let's plot an X in this bad boy. And consider the resulting trinomial. It looks like X squared minus 7X plus 6. We'll keep that X. But we'll break up the green trinomial and solve product of two binomials. My first are x and x. And my last are the factors of 6, right, that sum to a negative 7. So it looks like same sign, both negative, and 6 and 1 will get us there. So each factor equal to 0 and solve separately. So I get x equals 0. X minus 1 equals 0, and X minus 6 equals 0. So it looks like we have 1, 2, 3 solutions. And factoring was the way to go. At this stage, factoring was appropriate because it was a greater than degree 2 polynomial. It was a higher degree polynomial. close. Remember, when we see an x minus 7 quantity squared, right, some people want to go ahead and, and foil that out. x minus 7 times x minus 7. And if we were simplifying to write in standard form, that would be an appropriate course of action. However, we're trying to solve. And right now there's a single squaring term. So don't. Don't foil that out. You're going to create an x squared and an x term. We want a single variable term, and so don't foil that out. Instead, let's just solve by taking square roots. So definitely taking square roots is the way to go for this one.
Macron is just a single variable term squared. So there's a single quantity squared. So best first step, abstract multiplier divide to get the quadratic term alone. So it looks like division by 3 will isolate the quantity. That gets us x minus 7 quantity squared equals 9. We can now undo square ring by square rooting. So x minus 7 equals positive and negative square root of 9. Sometimes that will reduce, sometimes it won't. But either way, I'll be able to split it up. So it looks like we got x minus 7 is equal to positive square root of 9 is 3. Or x minus 7 is equal to the opposite square root of 9, negative 3. And then we can simply finish it out with inverse operations. It looks like x equals 10 and x equals 4. I'll do a quick check with that 4 into the original. 4 minus 7 is negative 3. Quantity squared is 9. 9 times the 3 out front is 27. So both of these work. Awesome. All right, and one to go. Can't tell which method's best until I rearrange the standard form. Maybe we'll be able to see. I'm going to go ahead and do 2x squared minus 5x plus 2 equals 0. And while we practice using the quadratic formula, when we had a leading coefficient other than 1 and an odd linear term, I think this will factor. And so I'm going to go ahead and solve by factoring. And if I'm wrong, then we'll go back to the quadratic formula. So I'm going to try and factor first. I recognize a first, right, and a last. It'll give me an outer product of 4x and an inner product of 1x. Together, I know that if they're same sign, both negative, right, they'll give me that negative 5x. And so I'm going to go ahead and go for factoring because I like factoring, and it's quicker. It's quicker than the quadratic formula, so long as I recognize the factor. So by factoring, that's kind of a quicker way. Awesome. So we can go ahead and finish this out by set seeing each factor equal to zero and solve it separately. Utilizing the zero product property, I get add one divide by two x equals positive one half. Add two over two and voila, two solutions. Okay, so let's make sure that we're comfortable with the different methods. We're going to state each method and tell when it is most appropriate to use when solving quadratics. After our closure, you'll have an opportunity to work with a partner, another classmate, and get stamps on your solving by factoring polynomial worksheet, or I should say solving with factoring. And then you're also going to have some work time to work on solving equations worksheet number three. And I'm going to put the posted answer keys up on the back whiteboard and on the side whiteboard so you have an opportunity to check your answers while you're still in class. So first, let's go ahead and state each method and tell when it's most appropriate to use when solving quadratics. Right? So we've seen our four methods now. So what's one method, Jared? Um, Good, by taking the square roots. And that's appropriate if we have a single squaring term or quantity squared. Different method? Emily? Uh, completing the square. Completing the square, absolutely. So we've seen completing the square. Completing the square is most appropriate when we have a 
one x squared term and an even linear term or x term. Because then it was easy to take half of that middle term, right? Half of the middle term and square. Thank you. Different method. Hannah. Factoring, right? Factoring was appropriate when you had both an x squared and an x term, but I recognize the factors. And lastly, the formula so famous it uses the type equation for which it's able to solve. What's the final method, Jock? Quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. Mama baby. Good. Quadratic formula. Lots of reasons, but oftentimes leading coefficient other than one, so I'll call that ax squared, right? Uh, and or odd x term and or big numbers uh, and or can't factor, don't recognize the factor, it's difficult to factor. That's why you like to use in order can't, but roll this one around. Awesome. So now we're going to have an opportunity to practice. Your in-class activity, the solving uh, polynomial equations with factoring, right, is for stamps. And most of those can be solved. Well, all of them can be solved by factoring. If you want to use a different method, you, you may. I don't want you to think that you have to use factoring, but that's how we created it. When you are done with all the first, and you check your answers, right, come up to the front desk and you'll get your stamps on four. And then go ahead and go back and continue working. When you check your answers, you'll get your stamps on eight. And then you can work on your homework assignment. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.